get started. You are uh, everybody. My name is Jessica Hellman. I'm the University Director for the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. Actually, a lot of our meeting today is going to be run by Alyssa Welch, who maybe can wave in her window there. I'm just um, kicking us off. I have one item to share with you. Um, after welcoming you to this month where we're going to be fe featuring graduate research, uh, highlighting student research that's going on within the Midwest CASC is something we're going to do on a regular basis. This is our first go of it, and we have, we're have we really excited to welcome three um, presenters today. Before we get started, however, I want to share something cool with you all that happened recently, um, and uh, that is that you all will recall, many of you who have been on this call previously on our monthly science seminars, that uh, the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center was formed relatively recently. Activities in the region have been going on for some time, but a new consortium and a carve out for the Midwest region from the Northeast is a relatively new phenomenon, it began just last September. Next slide, Alyssa, please. And associated with that consortium are a group of uh, new partners, uh, the leads of whom and uh, the of our constituent organizations are listed on this slide. But in recognition of this new region uh, and the consortium of organizations that come together with the USGS to form the Midwest CASC, we had some visitors come to the University of Minnesota recently. Specifically, we had the great privilege of hosting Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland. Um, this was a, a rel relatively small uh, gathering that the Secretary wanted to have invite only. And we did two activities. And I wanted to share with you um, that this happened and a little bit of the insights that came from it. First, we hosted a round table focused on tribal adaptation uh, considerations and issues and um, tribal sovereignty as related to natural resource management and wild relatives and the responsibilities we have to uh, our natural environment in the Midwest region with respect to our tribal nations and tribal partners. Um, here are a few photos from that roundtable conversation. In addition to the secretary, we also welcomed our Lieutenant Governor, who's sitting here in the white on the corner, our Minnesota's uh, Senator, Tina Smith, is there also in the corner, uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum, uh, who represents our district here in, uh, in Minnesota in Congress, and then next to her uh, was um, Secretary Holland. And this roundtable, in this photo, are a couple of speakers, including one of our star students, um, who had an opportunity to share their thoughts with the secretary. Next slide, please. We also hosted a reception uh, where we had the opportunity for the secretary to acknowledge with a sort of COVID limited and very quickly put together reception, uh, the opportunity for her to hear about the CASC more generally and to interact with um, some of its key stakeholders recognizing that this was heavy emphasis on the University of Minnesota because we were hosting and it was a pretty quick event. But here she is, for example, the secretary interacting with a number of graduate students and with Olivia Ledi, who you'll, you all recognize as the CASC um, USGS director. Next slide. And then she shared some remarks with the audience. And I would like to share those remarks with all of you because I think they're important to the Midwest cask as a whole. And they, um, they identify a number of factors that are important in our work as we execute the cask. They're relevant to the presentations we're gonna hear from students today. And her remarks are relevant to the content we'll bring in the science seminar over time. So I'm gonna read, they're pretty short remarks. You all can pretend that I am Secretary Holland, which I clearly am not but I'm voicing uh, her words. She said, and I quote, hang with me here for a moment because it's a little bit of a speech. It's incredible to be with you all to celebrate the long awaited creation of the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. Minnesotans, her primary audience at the moment are Minnesotans, have so many amazing outdoor traditions, catching walleye in the summer, skiing in the winter and everything in between. 
This adventurous spirit has instilled a strong commitment to preserving Minnesota's natural heritage for future generations. But our world is changing quickly. Climate change is no longer a distant threat, but a reality in every community across the country, and it threatens the wild places we love. It will take all of us working together to restore balance to our world, using the best available science, lived experience, and traditional knowledge to move ahead. And this vision has brought us here today. Today, we celebrate the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center's commitment to environmental justice. Here, she's specifically referencing the roundtable we had previously held. She says, the climate doesn't discriminate. Every community faces more extreme weather and the costs associated with the pain and heartache that these events bring. But not every community has the resources to rebuild or even relocate when a climate event happens in their backyards. The climate crisis disproportionately impacts communities of color and poor families. I come from a community that has borne the burden of development, says Secretary Holland. It's a legacy that impacts the health and well being of our communities. It breaks my heart to hear about communities who have struggled there to leave their lands because of climate threats or individuals struggling with homelessness being left out in extreme heat or flooding, or rural farmers and ranchers who can no longer sustain themselves or their farms because the rain stopped coming. The Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center has tools to ensure we can engage with communities who feel the impacts of climate change. This center bridges knowledge institutions and resource management to help our lands, waters, and wildlife adapt to new conditions. It allows experts from federal agencies and universities, tribal nations and management agencies, nonprofits and communities to join in the scientific process and create their own solutions. She goes on to say, this tool is a component of the locally led collaborative conservation vision laid out in President Biden's America the Beautiful Initiative, which challenges us to conserve 30% of our lands and waters for future generations. It's an initiative that is powered by transformation of $1.4 billion for ecosystem restoration and resilience and 510 million to the USGS scientific research in president's bipartisan infrastructure law. During my visit, Secretary Holland says, I have been particularly impressed by the strength and enthusiasm of the Midwest CASC host, yay, the University of Minnesota, by the CASC's deep and respectful partnerships and by the future, clim future climate professionals currently with us as graduate students, which we will be featuring in just a moment. These students and this new center make it clear that the future of the Midwest natural heritage is in good hands. It is this innovation and commitment to equity that gives me hope for the future. Thank you all for being here, she says, and more importantly, thank you for your commitment to leaving a livable planet for future generations. So we thought it would be perhaps a little bit inspiring and reminds us uh, why we are all gathered here to hear these, to share these words of Secretary Holland with you, where she emphasizes the partnership and the important work that we do here together and the need to strive towards solutions and to build capacity for the future. So thank you for indulging me those brief remarks um, and uh, the opportunity to share them with you. And with that, uh, even if anyone has any comments or questions or is interested in seeing the text of those remarks I just shared, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to copy and paste it and fire it off to you. Uh, and I would now like to pass the mic to Alyssa Welch, who will also introduce herself, right, Alyssa? Sounds great, Jessica, thank you. Yes, hi, everybody. Um, as Jessica said, I'm Alyssa Welch. I am the program manager for the Midwest CASC. Just about a month new still, um, and um, just delighted to be on board. There are some amazing things going on, and um, the Holland event, Secretary's Holland event, was um, a great way to start out um, my experience with the CASC. Um, moreover, things like student engagement um, are, are are things that will um, continue to be a focus of the CASC moving forward, um, and I'm delighted to. Um, to tee this up today for our student researchers. Um, as Jessica mentioned, we were super pleased that Secretary Holland was interested in meeting with some of the student researchers while she was visiting to talk with them about their research projects. 
And across the CAST network, there's a recognition that the importance of student researchers in climate adaptation science um, is really special, that the more opportunities that we are able to provide to students in this space, the more future peers and practitioners um, we have in this space, and we can help them along um, on this journey as well. Um, so for the Midwest CASC currently, um, we are funding directly or indirectly more than 50 students um, that represent uh, just about a dozen institutions across the Midwest. Um, we showed briefly the map of the CASC earlier on in the webinar um, to give you a sense of how those institutions um, are spread out. And we engage the students in a variety of ways through the CASC. Um, those can be directly working with consortium partners that we have and um, as PI, um, under PI leads, um, it can be through sub awards from the consortium leads to expand our research networks. Um, currently, we're in the process of hiring a postdoctoral fellow who will be focusing on best practices for the development of climate adaptation plans. And our consortium partners have a variety of ways that they're engaging students as well. For example, the College of Menominee Nations uh, Tribal Research Experience for undergraduate students uh, will be um, uh, kicking off again this summer here. And next month's science seminar, we will be able to identify the, the next cohort of students coming in for the coming academic year that are funded through the CASC. So we are um, just delighted to be able to offer that opportunity. Um, as part of the Midwest CAST commitment then to engaging and mentoring and funding and providing training opportunities uh, for students to grow their professional experience, we are delighted to host three of those students here today. So today's presenters are Michael Benson, who is a PhD candidate from IU Bloomington, Nikki Berry, a PhD candidate from Miami University of Ohio, and Maddie Nyblade, a PhD candidate from University of Minnesota Twin Cities. I am going to um, first turn it over to Michael, then Nikki, then Maddie. They will all present approximately 10, 15 minutes, share their research with us. And then after the three have um, concluded, we'll turn it over to a, a short Q&A session. So if you have questions that arise as uh, our presenters are moving forward, uh, drop them in the Zoom chat and we will um, we'll get to those as part of our Q&A afterwards. Um, Michael, I will, I will hand it off to you if you wanna launch your screen share and take it from here. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um... Um, I, I believe you need to stop your screen share so I can pull up my presentation. Excellent, thanks. All right, can you uh, see my screen all right? Yep, we got it. Perfect. All right, well, hi everyone. I'm uh, Michael Benson. I'm a PhD student at Indiana University working with uh, Dr. Kim Novick. Um, today I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of the research that our lab does and also some of the future work I plan to do as a graduate assistant with the Midwest CASC. Um, so I just want to start with a little bit of background about myself. Um, so I'm an ecophysiologist, a uh, forest ecophysiologist, and I took somewhat of a, of a unique approach to uh, um, forestry science. So I was uh, raised in Oklahoma, a land of very few tree cover, and uh, did my undergraduate at University of Oklahoma, um, learning about, you know, um, grassland community composition and evolutionary history. Uh, but after uh, uh, my undergraduate study, I took a job with the Forest Service where I really started to learn more about forestry science, uh, working at the Coweta Hydrologic Lab in Western North Carolina, uh, where I was looking at uh, plant water use kind of in the context of uh, watershed hydrology, um, which is really what connected me to my, my uh, current uh, lab group here in Indiana. I was uh, employed as the, the Lead technician of a eco of a eddy covariance flux tower in Morgan Monroe State Forest. Um, you can think of this as kind of a sophisticated weather station that measures a variety of, of uh, meteorological variables, but also sort of uh, the net ecosystem exchange of carbon and water molecules between the atmosphere and the um, and the landscape. 
Um, and I liked my research group so much and living in Indiana was pretty nice that I decided to transition over to being a PhD student, kind of working in the, the same lab group, uh, which is the current position that I'm in today. Um, so I think the research in the Novik lab here, here at Indiana University can kind of be summarized as really looking at this interaction between climate and the landscape and the ecosystem services that the landscape provides and kind of how this dynamic changes um, as climate changes. And so, you know, this, this requires a variety of techniques. Often we look at the ecosystem scale using these uh, flux towers, as I mentioned, um, but we also spend quite a bit of time uh, looking at the individual contribution of the different species on the landscape. And, uh, you know, kind of a, a common theme throughout our work is that um, relative to other dominant species, oak tend to behave rather, um, have rather unique uh, physiological behavior and likewise provide rather unique contributions to ecosystem function. So, you know, oak species are incredibly abundant here in Indiana and across the Eastern US in general. And they're an incredibly important um, ecological uh, species that has been shaping ecosystem function for millennia. Um, so they're a keystone forest food resource for wildlife. They're fire tolerant, they help regulate stream flow. And they also, importantly, they tend to maintain growth um, during droughts, which is they're a, a rather large contribution to the overall uh, carbon sink strength of Eastern US forests. Uh, but unfortunately, oak species have also been declining throughout uh, the 20th century uh, and being replaced by species like poplar, um, beech, and maple. Um, this map up here, this is looking at relative density change and relative volume change of oak species since 1980. And you can see that, you know, all these, these pink regions across the eastern U.S. are areas where we've seen a rather pronounced decline in oak species. And we don't really have a great understanding of why. Um, so we know that the eastern U.S. has had a rather uh, colorful legacy of different management regimes and disturbance. And so there's been a few um, uh, drivers that have been proposed, such as differences in management, uh, climate, fire suppression, or some sort of interconnected um, factor between these, these different drivers. However, all of these different hypotheses are rooted in this prevailing assumption that oaks are very drought tolerant. Uh, but are they drought tolerant? Well, you know, this perspective can really be sourced uh, to a variety of uh, review papers that um, came out in the 90s and early 2000s, which highlight that oaks tend to dominate arid landscapes. They tend to be deep rooted and can access sort of deeper and more stable um, soil moisture pools. And as mentioned, they tend to maintain photosynthesis and growth during drought. However, we know that, um, you know, continuing to assimilate comes at some um, cost to, to plant health. So for a plant to continue to assimilate CO2 during drought, they have to leave their stomates open at the consequence of losing more water and increasing transpiration, potentially driving plant water potentials down and causing um, plant water stress, um, which is fine as long as a plant can sort of um, has a hydraulic framework that can tolerate this level of transpiration. But um, some recent work in our lab sort of identified that this isn't necessarily the case. So over here on, our, on the right, this is looking at um, what we refer to as a hydraulic safety margin, which you can think of as characterizing you know, the level of, of transpiration that occurs um, relative to these critical thresholds, which cause um, hydraulic damage and, and plant desiccation. And what we see is that across a variety of climate envelopes in the eastern U.S. that um, relative to um, other dominant species, oak tend to operate at sort of zero or negative hydraulic safety margins. And so what, what this suggests is that, yes, um, oaks can grow quite, quite well during drought conditions, but they do so by jeopardizing um, hydraulic health. So, you know, despite this propensity to not regulate their water loss, their hydraulic systems are, in fact, quite vulnerable to desiccation. And so this puts oaks kind of in a, in a rather precarious position, right? This might be a strategy that favors them that they can sort of grow and outcompete during mild drought, but it puts them quite at extreme risk of desiccation if drought is um, quite severe. Um, and so, you know, these recent findings kind of motivated our lab group to sort of synthesize a variety of projects um, relating to oak to kind of update this perspective on oak drought tolerance in the eastern U.S. and kind of in the context of their declining abundance. Um, so this is a, a paper that just came out uh, recently here in April uh, in bioscience, in which my contribution to this project was really to look to see, well, are oaks drought resistant um, relative to their co-dominance when our metric of drought tolerance is, is survival and not necessarily um, growth? Or, you know, does this hydraulic trait characterization actually reflect mortality on the landscape? Um, and so to do this project, we relied on, um, we analyzed mortality patterns from uh, repeat forest inventory observations and particularly leveraging the rather data rich um, resource that is the forest service, uh, the forest inventory analysis program. Uh, for those unfamiliar, this is a rather robust uh, forest census on sort of the status of United States forests where um, across tens of thousands of permanent plots in the lower 48, um, they go and record um, which species are there and different site characteristics and they repeat these measurements every five years. Um, and so for, the, for this project, we specifically focused on this four state region of uh, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, with mortality and looking at mortality associated with the 2012 Midwestern drought, which was a, a quite quite a severe drought and at least uh, one of the worst ones to hit the region in the last 100 years. 
And so really, we only focused on these regions that um, experienced either a severe or extreme drought with left us about 4,000, a little bit more than 4,000 plots. And we looked at oak mortality relative to the 20 most abundant species are those which accounted for more than 10,000 observations in our FIA data set. Um, and so there are many different approaches one can take to uh, looking at uh, uh, mortality from repeat forest inventories. However, our approach was a little bit unique. And specifically, we wanted to make this sort of subtle but important distinction that the abundance of mortality on the landscape does not necessarily reflect physiological drought resistance. So what do I mean by that? So we know that some species are just more abundant than others, such that, you know, if we just looked at the total mortality after disturbance, some, you know, a highly abundant species might die more just because there happens to be more of them. Uh, we know that some species are longer lived than others, and they might die more frequently due to non-drought regions and non-drought reasons, which I kind of refer to as baseline mortality, uh, which can bias our estimation of, of how many trees actually died from that drought. And we also know that trees, um, that drought might ne not, not necessarily kill a tree immediately following drought, and that we really need to have kind of a flexible window after the drought for that tree to finally uh, be classified as dead. And so we contend that, you know, looking at this post-disturbance uh, mortality is really best um, assessed as this, as this change in mortality rate or this sort of post-disturbance um, mortality corrected by these different baseline uh, mortality rates. Um, and finally, uh, we just use this information to calculate a, a relatively simple uh, relative mortality metric, um, looking at the difference between um, the change in oak mortality to the non-oak mortality with a positive value suggesting that there was more, there was greater oak mortality than their non-oak counterparts while a negative value would suggest the opposite. And finally, you know, when working in a large spatial area like we did with this project, it's really important to recognize that not all species are equally affected um, by climate drought. Um, so if we just consider, you know, just sort of a generic forest landscape, uh, we know that trees tend to dominate very different um, regions on the landscape. We might consider this red species to sort of occupy more mesic landscape positions, while this gray species might um, grow in more, more arid conditions. Uh, we also know that the history of drought disturbance can differ across a region and can be really important in informing us about mortality. So, you know, the number of droughts that a tree has experienced can really tell us something about whether this next drought is going to effectively kill that tree. And finally, there may just be sort of the, the presence of a variety of different climate refugia, such as things like, um, you know, lakes or rivers, where when these trees, you know, grow along, along uh, these areas, you know, even if there's a reduction in, in precipitation, they're effectively physiologically not really experiencing drought. They're sort of um, kind of buffered by um, a high, highly abundant water resource. And so what, what this is all suggesting is that, um, you know, even if a meteorological drought is ubiquitous across an area, that might not necessarily reflect um, uh, the physiological consequence that a tree experiences. So you could imagine if we compare mortality, say, between these two species in these very spatially separate plots, you know, um, the, the actual physiological consequence could be very different and we might get a very different picture of what, what mortality, um, of, of relative physiological mortality. Um, but, you know, a really simple and effective way to sort of normalize these landscape complexities is just by really only considering these plots where these species co-occur. And so by taking this approach, we can effectively um, ensure that, you know, they're growing under very similar pedo-environmental conditions, and we can also ensure that they have very similar climate legacies. And so for this project, this is what we did, where we looked at relative mortality only in these co-occurring plots. Um, and when we take this approach, we find something, you know, somewhat surprising. This is looking at relative mortality with greater oak mortality, um, again, being positive, greater non-oak mortality being negative. And for our white oak and red oak species in our, in our sites, uh, this is looking at these open squares are, are, are sort of our raw relative mortality, and then our black circles are, are um, weighted by the number of oak species present in each of those plots. And what we see is that, um, yes, that, you know, and at least regards to extreme drought, that oaks tend to be more vulnerable to drought um, than many of their co-dominants, kind of in contrast to this sort of prevailing expectation. Um, so this is uh, some work that's already um, complete, um, and, you know, it's really kind of a narrow perspective on the whole paper. If you're interested, I encourage you to check it out. But we think that there's a lot of uh, utility in using this type of framework to um, look at uh, drought resilience. Um, so we know, you know, in the context of, of climate change that, you know, forest management and risk, and risk assessment is really informed by an accurate characterization of understanding which species on the landscape will thrive or falter in a drought prone future. Um, and really, we need to rely on sort of these techniques that can effectively normalize um, these differences across large spatial heterogeneity, such as um, our approach tends to do. So um, kind of here in the next year as a, as a graduate assistant in the, in the Midwest CAS, we're hoping to expand this framework um, to go beyond oak species and establish a drought resilience rank across um, a variety of Midwest um, CAS forests. 
And so, you know, this will involve um, taking a variety of data sources and synthesis with the, you know, the, the aims of producing a, a product, such as a report of the, of the number of which species are vulnerable to climate change and which are quite resistant, um, with a particular focus on this clear communication, you know, trying to disseminate this, this um, information to a variety of private and public uh, management resources and giving this, this um, you know, valuable information to, to uh, those who are most adept to utilize it. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, that's that's all I have. And I look forward to your questions. So thank you. Thanks so much, Michael. That was great. We, uh, as I mentioned before, we'll save some questions till the end or pop them in the chat. Nikki, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our Midwest um, project that we are working on. And whoops. so just to give a little bit of background, um, globally, many inland lakes are increasing in water temperature and are swarming. And these warming effects are likely to cause a decline in suitable habitat for adult species of both cool and cold water fish. Um, and for this talk, I'm really interested in a creating species called Cisco. Um, that's a Im pretty important fish um, as hopefully you'll find out. And so there's been a lot of research looking at this habitat squeeze, both um, it's again, looking at the adult stage and during that ice-free period uh, of the year where the surface waters are warming and then the bottom waters are kind of losing oxygen. And so there's this like vertical um, habitat squeeze. And uh, there's been a decent amount of research that has gone into looking into this, many of which has been done by our collaborators that are involved with this um, Midwest CAST project with us. And a lot of the take home messages that are, are coming out of this, I think has been really to try to identify um, lakes that are still existing that can serve um, suitable as suitable habitats. And a lot of this, again, has been focused on um, emphasizing the adult life stages for uh, these inland lakes. And in particular, we've been working closely with the Minnesota DNR in looking at um, using their Sentinel Lakes program, as well as the numerous other lakes that they have in the state uh, to try to understand more about uh, the Cisco. And so for our Midwest CAST project, what we're really interested in is focusing on the consequences of essentially the loss of winter on the earlier life stages of these fish. So a little bit of background about me. I'm from Brunswick, Ohio. I'm a Midwesterner as well. Um, my town is about an hour south of the shoreline of Lake Erie near Cleveland. And so I didn't really have a lakefront community or anything growing up, but winters were certainly a huge part um, as we did get a lot of lake effect snow as we were growing. Um, older. I went into Ohio Northern University for my undergraduate career. Um, I got to serve as our university mascot, which is a polar bear. So again, that strong tie for winter um, and love of cold weather. And then I also took a field semester course uh, with Solomon David, where his um, love for fish really kind of got me hooked in a career going more towards uh, staying in ecology. So I went on to Miami University and Craig Williamson's Global Change Limnology Laboratory where I completed my thesis and looked at the effects of UV radiation and regulating the aquatic stages of mosquitoes. And what I did for my thesis is really set the foundation um, work in my baseline understanding that I've continued now for my dissertation um, in Craig's lab, looking at the effects of UV radiation on the early life stages of freshwater fish. And so this image here is really kind of the, the overarching kind of conceptual framework for my dissertation. But for this project, I'm really interested in, um, for the Midwest cask at least, we're really interested in, again, this loss of winter and especially specifically the loss of ice cover and how that may be interacting with UV radiation and regulating these earlier life stages of fish. So we talk about UV radiation. You can easily think about um, getting an individual getting sunburn and how um, getting suntan may be damaging your skin or tissue cells. DNA damage, things of that sort. Well, the same thing can happen to fish, especially if found in really clear habitats. And so um, these two hammerhead sharks here is an example of one fish that has actually adapted to suntan in the presence of UV. Um, kind of shifting back to this concept of the loss of winter and how this may affect cold water species of fish such as cisco. 
uh, we really want to think about the earlier life stages. So these fish are going to spawn in the fall and their eggs are going to overwinter under ice. And there's been um, evidence that ice cover and kind of a long standing understanding that years of strong ice cover um, often are correlated with strong year classes, which are ultimately going to help with recruitment for this species of fish. And part of the reason um, it's thought that uh, strong ice cover may be helping these early life stages of fish is that it could pro provide physical um, protection from disturbances of the lake like wind or wave action that could otherwise damage the eggs. But ice cover can also block sunlight and specifically those damaging wavelengths of UVB radiation, which our lab's interested in um, looking at. And so if we're thinking that ice cover is blocking UV, then of course, years without ice cover or the depletion of ice cover as a result of loss of winter in the Midwest could mean that we're increasing the risk of exposure to UV radiation, and especially during these early life stages, like the egg stage in particular. But to know how that is going to ultimately affect Cisco in the future, we need to first understand what the, the relationship is between the egg and exposure to UV. And so we call that our UV tolerance, which is just the level of UV exposure at which 50% survivorship occurs. So for this Midwest cask, with the help of the Minnesota DNR and our um, collaborators on this project, we've had eggs um, sent to us as well as other places across the Great Lakes. We've had eggs, uh, Cisco eggs sent to us. We culture them in the lab until the, about the eyed stage, in which we take a subset, put them on what we call the phototron and expose them to multiple levels of damaging UV radiation. We then monitor those eggs for multiple days and record their survivorship. So overall, um, I'll just orient you on this figure real quick. The x-axis is our populations of four different populations of Cisco that we've tested. And again, these are the results for just the eggs. And the y-axis is their UV tolerance. So that's where 50% survivorship is expected. And this gray dashed line is approximately about a day's worth of exposure during summer solstice. So that's kind of what we can estimate as about the maximum level of UV that we would expect if these eggs were hatching in the summer or incubating during the summer, but they're in the winter. So it's likely that environmentally those UV levels are much lower um, than this dashed line. And you can see that our eggs will survive. They're probably going to do all right. But what we didn't expect was that when we exposed eggs to UV, which is included in both these green treatments of full sunlight versus the UV only treatment that's um, pink here, the eggs actually hatched much earlier than they were if they were just kept in the dark. And so this um, induction of hatching in the presence of UV was something we weren't really expecting, but we wanted to think about more. Um, kind of summarize this, basically UV radiation exposure is going to increase seasonally from the winter as we pro progress onwards seasonally through to the spring. And so if eggs are developing under ice for all that time, they might be perfect, protected from damage from UV and they could be developing to develop more protective mechanisms. So when they hatch um, later, closer to the spring, UV exposure levels might be high at that time, but they may have mechanisms of protection that have developed that could help combat that exposure. Um, on the flip side, eggs that hatch much earlier might not get exposed to as high of levels of UV exposure. Um, but they might have to spend their energy and metabolic energy in searching for food or other um, resources that otherwise can't be spent in developing those UV protections for later on into the season. Another thing we wanted to think about, of course, is with the loss of winter, part of the cause of that is an increase in temperature. And temperature has been strongly correlated with hatching dates of eggs. So we did an experiment where we exposed the eggs to both UV and we also expose them at multiple temperatures. So the x-axis is our temp water temperature during the exposure and our y-axis is again the days um, to hatch after that initial exposure. And all of our gray dots, those are all of the dark controls in which temperature had no effect on the day to hatching. Whereas our green and our pink treatments, again, those are our UV exposed eggs. And those eggs did hatch significantly earlier than the dark controls and only within the um, UV treatments was there an increase in, or I should say a reduction in hatching date um, with an increase in temperature. And so our take home message uh, that we hope to kind of get from this and, and 
of course, we're still continuing. I've only presented here about the eggs, but the larvae uh, is something we'd like to expand into as well, is that with earlier hatching, there's a potential for phenological mismatches to increase. Um, as these eggs hatch earlier, their food may not be available. And when we're considering our suitable spawning habitats, we wanna consider both damaging UV radiation as well as these oxothermal um, habitat demands that are kind of currently being investigated. And with that, I'll take, um, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators in uh, the agencies and organizations working on this project. Really fascinating, Nikki, thank you. I see that there are some questions starting to come in in the chat as well. Um, please continue to, uh, to grow that chat and we'll switch over to question and answer after our final presenter goes, uh, Maddie Nyblade. Thank you and thank you all for joining for my presentation. Um, I will uh, begin now. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing some of my research um, on as part of a large collaborative partnership between University of Minnesota Twin Cities researchers and several tribes and intertribal organizations across the Upper Great Lakes region. And so our collaborative is named Kawe Gada Nana Gada Wendingen Manongen Pising. And that translates from Ojibwe to first we must consider wild rice. So Manomen is the Ojibwe word for wild rice. Pasing is the Dakota word for wild rice. And I will be sharing some stories and science from this partnership that we have been working on. That is also part of the Midwest CASC. I also wanna acknowledge that the work that I'm sharing here is a product of many folks who've contributed to this work, as well as many people who have taught me about Monomen and how to do this work in a good way. And many of those folks are pictured here as well as others who are not on this. And some of you are on the call too, who are our collaborators. I will start by sharing a bit about who I am. I am a white settler scientist. I grew up in central Pennsylvania. Um, my younger, I have one younger sister who's pictured here. Um, and I, similar to uh, the previous speaker, love the winter as well. I really love to ski. And I love being outside. And because of that, that drew me to an undergraduate degree in geosciences at Penn State, um, where I was interested in studying water and water resource management. And I was really interested in working directly with communities to think about how to create and protect water resources into the future, and specifically thinking about environmental justice. But in my undergraduate degree, I didn't see a lot of my professors working on questions of environmental justice that centered communities in the way that I felt like I wanted to through my work. So I left science for a bit and worked in outdoor education, working with youth in New England area. And then at a conference a few years later, I was lucky to meet my current co-advisor, Dr. Crystal Ng, who uh, shared a story of work of how they started this collaborative that I'm now a part of, where they, centered tribal priorities and building relationships rather than rushing into scientific research. And that story of researchers putting relationships first rather than rushing into science that centered academic priorities really resonated with me um, and drew me to work on this project that I'm sharing about with you today. I wanna to start by acknowledging that I am currently on Dakota homelands um, and our research is also on Dakota homelands. Um, I am currently in Minneapolis in the Twin Cities, close to the Badote, which is the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers, where the Dakota people came into being, and they've been on these lands since time immemorial. And this is a map showing uh, the extent of their homelands, and that Dakota people have a relationship with Pasing or wild rice as well throughout their homelands. And our project is working to build relationship with Dakota communities. Um, and this is something we're still working on and it's not a central piece of this presentation, but um, that is something we are looking to do better. The Anishinaabe also are on these lands. They migrated from the East Coast following, led by a prophecy to find the place where food grows on water. So they migrated through the Great Lakes. One of the groups within the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe, um, came here to the present day Minnesota, upper northern Minnesota and present day Wisconsin, where we see a lot of monomen, where wild rice in Ojibwe. 
So Monomen is the cultural foundation and sacred relative for the Ojibwe people. You can see a picture here of Monomen in July on the Perch, on Perch Lake on the Fond du Lac Reservation. And when it's growing in its full abundance on a lake, it completely blankets the lake. And is um, this really beautiful picture here of all of this monomen. But it also goes through many other life stages, including one in late May through June in the floating leaf stage, which is just pictured here. And then it flowers um, mid-July in these purple flowers, and it's ready for harvest by the end of August or early September. Here is a picture depicting the life stages of monomen. Um, the, and, and you can see the Ojibwe words here for each life stage as well. And I'm sharing this just as a brief glimpse of all of the knowledge that the Ojibwe people have about monomen, about these landscapes and about living sustainably here. And one of our goals on our project is to learn respect, respectfully from this knowledge and share our knowledge in ways that support tribes. And so this is again, a recap of the life stages of monomen. I also want to emphasize that tribes are, are sovereign nations and their sovereign nations existed prior to the US colonization. And so I'm just quickly showing here two maps of the uh, land session treaties that were signed. I don't have time to go into this, but I encourage everyone to, to look into what treaty lands they're on and learn their history. Um, and since white settlement, there has been massive landscape change on these lands that has significantly led to the declines in Monomen. Some of those landscape changes are pictured here. Another harm to Monomen is that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities uh, researchers cultivated wild rice without consent from Ojibwe tribes. And they continue to do this cultivation research and genetics research on wild rice, again, without appropriate consultation. And the Minnesota Chippewa tribe has asked repeatedly for the U to stop this research, but it continues. And so that is a point of tension and an example of where the University of Minnesota, one example of where the University of Minnesota has not respected tribal sovereignty and doing research that centers tribal priorities and is actually causing harm. So we have taken a different approach for our research. Um, instead of doing the academic research from that, that prioritizes the university, the settler institution um, agenda, we center tribes and respect tribal sovereignty. Again, tribes are sovereign nations and we do this and center their priorities within the research. And we do this through taking those time, the time to build relationships, through going and visiting, um, having conferences where we hear from tribal governments, elders, resource managers to hear their priorities, hear concerns they have with working with the university and creating ways that can hold researchers accountable to do work in a good way. Specifically, we have memorandums of understanding, so legal documents between tribal governments and the researchers that outline respectful and ethical protocols for our research. There's a lot here. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of it, but I just want to emphasize um, part of this is data ownership. So tribes are sovereign nations and have the rights to own and control their own data. So we, as researchers in the University of Minnesota, have a document that explains how we manage and own data and share data with tribes to protect their sovereignty so that they own their own data and have control over it. Through working with tribes, the university researchers, myself included, have learned so much about the expansive interconnected system of Monomen. We started our research thinking mostly about how sulfate contamination from mines causes increased toxic le toxin levels and de de causes declines in Monomen health. But working with our tribal partners, we learned there's many more causes and important characteristics to think about when supporting monomen health. And these important factors are connected to a much wider and interconnected system that includes our own research and research collaboration. Um, and so this is a messy diagram here, but I'm my point in sharing this is that we have been learning about how interconnected the system is and very much connects to climate change that we're here to talk about today. And so while learning about this complicated system. I've also been, we've been challenged as researchers to think about how we are part of supporting Monomen Health, how our scientific research can support state, federal, tribal policies and laws, um, can support education, funding, different restoration practices um, that can ultimately support the health of Monomen. So while thinking about what research I am doing as a PhD student, I wanted to really think about how I could do work that's impacting, positively impacting Monomen Health. 
as well as tribes and tribal sovereignty. And we heard from tribes about their concern for climate change and they've done extensive vulnerability assessments and adaptation planning with climate change. Here's some pictures from some of their reports here. And in many of those reports, they identify Monoman as highly to extremely vulnerable to, to climate change. So that became a, one of the focuses on our research project. And through all of their research and hearing from tribes, um, you can see the many different ways outlined about how climate change can impact Monoman health through changing in precipitation and hydrology and water levels that impacts how sediment is mixed. Um, the importance of winter is also for, for a number of reasons impacting Monoman. And so to further explore all these complicated relationships, I decided to leverage the data that already existed um, within our partner partnering organizations and tribes. So the 1854 Treaty Authority, the Fond du, Lac Reserve, Fond du Lac Band and the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission have been doing extensive wild rice surveys for a long time, as well as other tribes. Um, and so I decided to use their data to do a statistical analysis to look at the relationship between, between climate and monoman health to pull out and find statistical evidence to support some of the, the relationships that tribal communities have observed um, relating to monoman and climate change. So I made two statistical models and I'll briefly go over these and then wrap up here, but I'm looking at trends through time. So one of the variables that are is part of the statistical model are trends for each water body, as well as trends for each um, source. So the 18 trends across the 1854 Treaty Authority data, the Glyphic data and the Fond du Lac data. I looked at the number of growing degree days relationship with monoman abundance, the number of freezing degree days. So again, getting at this winter question, um, the amount of precipitation and then uh, including snowfall. I built a second more uh, simple, smaller statistical model, just specifically looking at water levels and the relationship with monoman abundance because we had water levels um, for the 1854 Treaty Authority data. And we have heard from our partners how important water levels are in impacting monoman health and abundance. And so just to summarize the outcomes of the model here, um, many of those variables were not statistically significant, but the ones that were included precipitation during that floating leaf stage that I showed earlier. So with higher precipitation during that floating leaf stage, we see a statistically significant decline in monoman abundance. With increase in freezing degree days, we see an increase in monoman abundance. And with an increase in water levels during the floating leaf stage, we see a decline in monoman abundance. And so precipitation increasing during the floating leaf stage relates to higher water levels and that will con likely contributes to declines in monoman abundance. And so these results of this model aren't new to our partners, but hopefully this statistical analysis can better support um, and advocate advocacy for better management um, and help adaptation strategies moving forward to protect monoman in the face of climate change. And of course, there are more questions um, about how this uh, other relationships within the monoman system um, and how to move forward. So I'm excited to continue building this model with adding more complexities about the watershed characteristics as well as land use change over time. But again, I only looked at one or a couple of relationships here between monoman and climate change. And this we're part of this much more interconnected complex system. And there's many other parts of the research project that are focusing on different, part, uh, different parts of this system, including uh, building more physical based hydrologic models and scenario planning um, that will be part of our future work with the Midwest CAS. So thank you. Thanks, Maddie that uh, presentation. I'm going to switch over here and share my screen again. And why don't we start by, um, I know we just have a couple minutes for questions here, um, but maybe we can start by addressing the ones in the chat. And then I'd like to ask um, all of you just a couple kind of overarching questions as well. Um, so the first one from uh, Kristen over to Nikki. Are the eggs that you have from fish from field sites with differing amounts of ice cover and wondering about the evolutionary history of hatchlings and their response to UV? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I'll be completely honest. Well, I know 
that at least the eggs that we've tested so far are from four different lakes, uh, three being the Great Lakes versus one um, slightly smaller lake in Minnesota. Um, so I don't know actually the ice cover history across like each of those lakes and if they're similar or different um, other than that it's been declining. Um, but I do, I do know we have observed this hatching um, response in multiple populations that we've tested. Um, it's just the one, the most recent one that we have with um, from um, this lake in Minnesota has been the one that I've actually been able to like quantify these results and like really try to start to dig into them. Um, and so I think that's something in the future that as we get more fish to test, we're hoping to be able to kind of compare then across different sites. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> That's great. Um, Nikki, just a, maybe a quick reply then as well um, to the next question that came in about the mechanism whereby UV initiates the earlier hatch. Um, perhaps that it's about the embryo's oxygen demand. Is that something that you're measuring? Yeah, so we haven't been measuring necessarily oxygen demand, but I did start to record um, heart rates after they were hatching, if they were exposed to UV or not. Um, and I'm still kind of working through those data, so I'm not quite ready to um, draw any conclusions yet, but that is something that we're like kind of starting to look into and see what else is going on here. <laughs> so. Excellent. Thanks, Nikki. Um, another question directed at Maddie has come in. Um, wondering about the mechanisms associated with freezing degree days, increasing monomen. Um, Rebecca says she's working on tree and weed phenology in winter cold is really important and uh, wondered if you could address this. The seeds are in the water, so might not be buffered. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Um, so there's a couple of things that I know about um, with relationship between monomen and winters, one of which is that the seeds need a certain period of cold um, conditions, um, cold water conditions in order to germinate the following spring. So if the winter does not get cold enough, um, they won't germinate. Another piece of it is that monomen is an annual plant, so it regrows from a seed every year. And part of um, the other aquatic plants growing in those areas, some of those are perennial plants, and so they overwinter. So with harsher winters, more of those perennial plants will die and um, have a harder time regrowing, and that privileges monomen to be able to regrow in the winter or the following year. Um, it also could be related to um, the, the snowpack and that impacting the hydrology, the runoff import, might be important for flushing sediments and mixing sediment. Um, so bigger snowpack could in, contribute to um, better, higher monomen growth. So there's a lot of different uh, factors that could play into it. Excellent. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, Michael, I'm gonna ask you a question here as well. Um, I wondered if you had any suggestions for graduate students who might like to follow in, in your footsteps, you know, get involved in climate adaptation research. What advice would you have for um, students beginning or, or progressing in this space to be successful? Uh, thanks, yeah. Um, gosh, what a question. Uh, I, I, guess, I guess I would, I would suggest like, um, I mean, for me personally, what I ended up doing and was was wildly different than what I thought I was going to be doing. Um, and that, you know, I think I think environmental resilience and you know environmental science and all these different important things come in a variety of different ways. And you know, I think I think you can still answer important questions. And it's I think a lot of it is just sort of being flexible and open to opportunity and sort of pursuing an overall uh, greater goal. I I thought I was going to be stuck in a herbarium looking at evolutionary history of different grasses and I ended up climbing trees and towers and stuff so uh, yeah I think I think flexibility and just you know being able to to take on opportunity I think I think is really important so that's great thank you um Maddie if I could follow on with you here about um how this research project is informing your ideas um for your future career path if it is if it's not <laughs> Oh, it definitely is. I just don't know what my future career path is. Um, but I definitely is, I've been learning a lot about what it means and how to work with tribes and learning about tribal sovereignty um, and environmental justice and how to do work that really challenges the academic system to prioritize relationships um, and center the communities that we're working with. And so those will be 
skills and values I carry with me as I continue to continue on in my career. I don't know exactly where it is taking me, but it's definitely shown me that it is possible to do work like this in science and science can be a tool to support um, tribes, to support environmental justice and, and work towards decolonization. And so that has been a, a real point of inspiration for me. Um, not totally sure where I'm going, but it's definitely provided me those skills and hopefully I'll have a couple more years to figure it out, but ask me in a little bit, I guess. That sounds great. And Nikki, I'll finish with you. I would just ask, um, you know, what's what's the one thing you didn't expect about this research, about learning about yourself or about valuable partners or about communication? Um, what's something that you learned that you might share with the group? Um, I think I think pretty much I was not expecting myself to love um, winter or <laughs> any winter research, um, to be completely honest. And so I kind of feel like right now that's what I'm um, most shocked by is just the path that's um, where I've gotten, but I think that, you know, I just, I've had opportunities come my way and I've tried to take advantage of them, make the best out of them in any way that I can. And turns out I really enjoy what I'm doing. So I think it's worked out for the best. Thanks so much. Um, thank you to all of our presenters today. Really appreciate your time. Thanks to all the attendees who joined us as well and for the questions submitted. Um, our next monthly science seminar will be Monday, June 27th. Um, hopefully we'll have just a single Zoom link for that meeting um, to avoid some of the confusion we experienced today. So thanks for your patience for those of you who switched over. Um, I have been just really impressed with the caliber of research that our students presented here today and um, wanna underscore that uh, we, are, we are here to support that student experience and look forward to growing um, student cohorts more as we move forward um, as a Midwest CASC in the coming year. So thank you all. Have a great week and hope to see you next month.